You know, once in a while, something comes along that changes the way we live. A device so simple and intuitive that using it feels almost familiar. Introducing the 2015 First Church Bible. It's not a digital book or an e-book. It's a Bible book. The first thing to note is no cables, not even a power cable. The 2015 Church Bible comes fully charged and the battery life is eternal. The interface is 5.5 by 8.5 inches, but can expand to 12 by 8.5 inches. The navigation is based on tactile touch technology that you can actually feel. Content comes pre-installed via the 1232 high definition pages of inspiring scriptural ideas. To start browsing, simply touch and grab. Right to left to move forward, left to right to move backwards. Notice something else? That's right, no lag. Each crystal clear page loads instantaneously, no matter how fast you scroll. If you want to get a quick overview, just hold it in the palm of your hand and using just your thumb, speed browse the content. If you find something you want to save for later, you can simply bookmark it. And even if you close the application, you could easily find the bookmark again. Amazing. What about multiple users? For that, we introduced a simple color coding system to avoid confusion. If you want to share a particularly inspiring item, you literally share it. Another special feature is password protection, which is voice activated. Excuse me, that's mine. At First Church, we feel that technology this life enhancing should be in the hands of everyone. So the 2015 First Church Bible is free. You can download one from the First Church office. If it's not there, try to refresh the next day. Or you can upload yourself to the Sunday service and find one there. Experience the power of a Bible book. Good morning, guys. It's good to be with you. And again, my name's John. I'm the pastor here. We're in the middle of a series called You Asked For It. And uh, if you hadn't guessed it yet this week, we're asking the question, where did the Bible come from? How was it put together? Um, is it true? All of the above. And uh, I'm super excited to address that. I'm so glad to be back. My wife and I, were, um, we, we, we were from Minnesota. We were visiting her family. It's really awesome being with uh, my mother-in-law for two weeks. And... Um, <laughs> Loved every second of it. And, uh, you know, it's funny. We got to Minnesota, and we're like, this is, like, we, we forgot how lush and green and, and hilly Minnesota was. It is a beautiful place. And we were like, wow, this is more beautiful than, than Demont. And it is. It is. But uh, after being there for a short period of time, we're like, you know, we just, we missed the culture, and we missed the kindness, and uh, it really was. It was good to be back. We were super ready to come home. And it was cool to say, Kristen, I'm ready to come home. Um, leaving Minnesota. And uh, I just want you to know if it's your first time here or your second or your third time here, we've been here for, my wife and I have been here for like nine or ten months um, at this point. And uh, it's just a place where you're going to feel welcome. And I would just encourage you to jump into our community with both feet and uh, get plugged in because there are people here uh, who are worth doing life with. And uh, there are people here who want to welcome you. And uh, so it's super cool to be back. Like I said, this week we're addressing the question, where does this book come from? How was it put together? Why can we trust it? And uh, what we're going to do is um, synthesize a multi-week class that I've even taught here um, that I've learned from an old mentor of mine in Minnesota. And uh, we're going to talk about it today in a really short period of time. So just prepare yourselves, get ready. I mean, we're going to blast through this. We're going to get a lot of great information and hopefully some, some really good application at the end too. Um, and uh, I just, I want to start by, by breaking this message down into two parts, okay? And I think the first question that people ask when looking at the Bible is, how is it put together? Like, what, what actually, like, where did it come from? How was it put together? How does that work? And then secondarily, I'm going to answer the question, why should I believe it's from God? Okay? 
And uh, there's this verse in the Bible, 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, all scripture is inspired by God and useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong and so on and so forth. And whenever I get into a sermon like this, as a kid, a pastor would go to this verse and be like, the Bible's true because the Bible says that it's true. And I'm like, well, O.J. Simpson said that he wasn't a murderer, but you know what I mean? Sometimes you have to go to outside sources to get the actual truth. You know what I'm saying? And uh, so I promise you today, we're going to look at more than just what the Bible says about the Bible to talk about um, why we believe this book is true. I promise you, um, we'll go there and we're going to talk about why we believe it's from God. So that's, that's kind of cool. Um, the first thing I want you guys to know as we look at uh, where did the Bible come from and how was it put together is the, li- uh, the Bible is a library of books with supernatural unity. Okay, the Bible is a library of books with supernatural unity. So many times as a kid, I'd be like, man, I'm going to be super holy today. I'm going to come home. I'm going to start reading the Bible, and I'd open up to the first page, and I'd start reading, and I'd get through the book of Genesis, which is exciting, and Exodus, which is exciting, but then I'd get to Leviticus, and I'd be like, I don't like this book anymore. I'm done. Um, And that's because the Bible is a library of books, okay, a group of 66 different books that have been put together in one collection. You wouldn't go to the library and start reading about aardvarks and work your way through alphabetically the whole Dewey Decimal System. That would be insane. That would be frustrating. That wouldn't be fulfilling. It wouldn't give you pertinent information in your life. Um, And guess what? The Bible is very similar. You go to the book that is speaking into your life right now. There's 66 of them. You pick one and you read that, okay? You don't necessarily always read it cover to cover. So that's really important to understand. The Bible has um, 40 different authors, okay? 40 different authors in the Bible. The authors have different backgrounds. Some of them are rich. Some of them are super uber rich, like richer than Bill Gates. Solomon was the richest man who ever walked on the earth. Some of them were super poor. Um, Some of them were middle class, Uh, many different jobs. Some of the authors were politicians, and I know some of you guys are like, well, I'm never trusting it. It's over then. How can it be? I mean, it's politicians wrote some of it. It's not from God. But uh, anyway, uh, some of them were unemployed, also not a really great vindication for the Bible. Got to keep moving on. Some of them were warriors. Some of them were poets. Some of them were doctors. Some of them were fishermen. Now we're talking, okay? Now we're talking. Fishermen in the Bible, that's good. Um, It was written over... uh, Two primary sections, okay? So there's an Old Testament and a New Testament in the Bible. And the first three quarters of the Bible are Old Testament, and that just means before Jesus, talking about Jesus coming. And then the New Testament is the story of Jesus being here and then after um, he ascended into heaven, okay? And that's kind of how that's split up. And a lot of times you'll hear people talk about the Old and New Testament, and people are like, well, what, what, what does that actually mean? That's what it means, okay? Okay. Um, So you got that going on. I was written in three different primary languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, which is, you know, those are the languages of the Bible, pretty cool. Written over 1,500 years, started in 1452 B.C., And I know a lot of you guys are like, yeah, 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. The Bible was like, uh, you know, fresh ink right there. No, that's not true, okay? B.C., okay, B.C., thousands of years before Christopher Columbus, before, you know, way before, like go all the way down to zero and then start counting in backwards. 1452 B.C. is when Moses penned the first five books of the Bible. It was finished in 90 A.D. And uh, what you need to know is the authors wrote many different things. Uh, They wrote in their own styles with their own backgrounds. Some wrote poetry, some wrote history, some wrote criminal law, some wrote ethics, some wrote philosophy, some wrote sermons, and some just wrote notes to friends. Those of you who are like my age, you were right at the end of the notes generation, okay, before texting came in. We used to write notes on notebook paper, and then we'd fold them up into these intricate like origami squares, which is why origami exists, is to fold up your notes. You guys, anybody here remember passing notes to friends, folding them up? Yeah, yeah, okay. And then all the kids are like, wait, what is, what's a note? How does that work? I, I can't even write with my hand, um, you know? Do they even teach handwriting in school anymore? I don't even know. They might not. Uh, I know they don't teach spelling because I've gotten notes from kids before and it's like, oh my goodness, you're a senior in high school going to college. Um, Anyway, sorry, that was harsh, lots of murmuring. Yeah, that's my kid right there. All right, bring it back in. Um, But remember when you'd find a note and you would read it? You know, it'd be like, don't read it. I know I shouldn't. It's folded. It's for somebody else. But I really want to read this little square or I want to play paper football with it, one of the two. And uh, you'd open it up and you'd read it. That's what we do in the Bible sometimes. Like, it's literally just people's notes that they've written to each other, which is kind of interesting. Those are kind of some of the funnest books to read, actually, I think. 
And uh, here's the deal. I said, the Bible's a library of books with supernatural unity. What if I got 40 different people who lived over the course of 1,500 years, and I said, you guys can't talk to each other, okay? Some of you can read what others have written, but some of you can't, okay? And you need to write a book. You speak different languages, okay? You have different backgrounds, different everything. You guys need to write a book that presents the same cohesive message from start to finish, okay? Go. You'd have a disaster, right? I mean, it would be redonkulous. There's no way that you would have a book that would communicate the same cohesive message through it. And yet, one of the things that I love about the Bible is it is incredibly cohesive. It presents the same message from start to finish. God's plan to bless all nations through Jesus Christ. That's how it works. Starting from Genesis, going all the way through that whole book, it presents this uniquely cohesive message. And it is astonishing that this happened because archaeologically, we understand that the authors of Scripture had no contact with each other for the most part. We understand that many, much of the Bible was written without the authors having read other parts of the Bible. And yet, we have this incredibly cohesive message. And there's just no way that that's replicatable, you know, on any other level. I think that that's um, really cool. And, and I just want to make this statement only a God-inspired book could have this level of unity. I believe that. I believe that it is a supernatural level of unity. And when you get into it, when you get into the archaeology of it, when you actually think logically about all the facts surrounding the background of this book, it is truly miraculous. People are like, nah, I don't believe in miracles. Well, I've got one in my hand right now. I mean, it, it is. It is astonishing. Okay? Um, Next thing as far as how was the Bible put together, I just put God moved in the hearts of men to write down his words and supernaturally preserve them, okay? I'll break this down a little bit more. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 says, uh, above all, you must realize that no prophecy in scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding, okay? No, not, none of this book was like, ah, I'm just gonna write this. It was God, God inspired it. Or from human initiative, okay? Nobody was like, I think I'm going to write the Bible today, okay? God initiated. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and then spoke from God. And the way I think of it is, you know those really old sailboats that could only go downwind? You know, the kinds with oars on them? You know, if you had to go upwind, it just has one big square sail, like Viking ship type of thing, okay? You could only go downwind when the wind was blowing. The, the captain could steer the boat a little bit, but he was going to be directed by the wind. And that's the way I imagine God directing the, the, the authoring of Scripture. That's the, way, that's the way I see it being written. The, the authors were carried along by the wind. I want to talk a little bit about scriptural preservation, because I said in there um, that, that God supernaturally preserved the Bible. There is this incredible... Have you guys ever played a game of telephone before, you know, the game telephone, where you, you start with one side, you whisper something to someone's ear? When my wife and I play with uh, a group of people, um, uh, and consequently, we might get to hang out with the, the youth group kids this fall, which would be really neat. But when we play with a group of people, uh, sometimes in youth group, my wife always does, uh, John Hill is the most handsome man I've ever seen. That's what it starts out as. And it just, it always gets corrupted. By the end, it's, it's, it's like Rich Heemstra is the most handsome man I've ever And it's like, oh, how did that happen? This is ridiculous. I mean, how did that get corrupted so badly, right? But, um... Nonetheless, okay, bring it back in. Nonetheless, the Bible is an incredibly, and I believe supernaturally preserved book, okay? I'll give you a little bit of insight into what was called scribal culture, the people who copied the Bible, because what, what this is is a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, but let me explain this for a moment, okay? Um, the people who copied the Bible were called scribes, and they had a super developed, incredibly fanatic culture, fanatical culture, um, surrounding the way that they wrote the Bible. First off, they would write one letter at a time. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, is Genesis 1-1, and they would start with I, and then they would go N, and then they would go space, and then they would go T, you know, right on, right on through. That's, that's how it worked, okay? That's how they would do it. They would put the space of a hair between each letter. Um, the scribe was the only person in that culture who was allowed to blow off the king. Okay, if the king walks in the room, everybody else would have to bow to the king. But it was believed that the word of God was more important than, um, than a king. And so a scribe who was copying the word of God could just blow off the king. They could ignore the king. Um, scribes had to have, not only would they copy one letter at a time, okay, I, N, T, you know, whatever. Um, they had to have the whole Bible memorized. So you want to be a scribe? Great. Quote Exodus 3, verse 20 to me. Go. You know, not only did they have to have it memorized, but they had to have it memorized so that they could quote any section of it just when the, when the, the interviewer would ask them, okay? So that's an astonishing, not only were they copying one letter at a time, 
out of a book that they already had memorized. They had an incredible fact-checking system, too, where they would have this, this guy called the counter-scribe. He'd be the head scribe, and he would count to the middle of each row of every single book of the Bible as people wrote them. And he knew what the middle letter was, and any time there was an error, he'd catch it. That's how they fact-checked the Bible. Each book was allowed to have a maximum of three errors, three cross out, three whoopsies. Um, and after that, if it had more than three, if you were doing Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, you were copying it, it has 66 chapters. Let's say you were on chapter 66, second to the last word. You make your fourth mistake, they would burn it, okay? Because they didn't want to, can you imagine six months work and they'd light it on fire? You know, I mean, that'd be terrible. Uh, unfortunately, farmers are experiencing something similar to that right now, you know? And so that's, that's, how, that's how it felt. That's what they would do. They would, they would just destroy it right there. But... If you had a copy of the Bible that actually made it, um, when that copy wore out, you wouldn't burn it because it was the word of God. What you would do is when you took worn out copies of scripture, you would bury them. And um, this is really, really important because that's why when they would bury a copy of scripture, instead of getting rid of it, throwing it away, whatever else, um, that's why we have so many copies of the Bible preserved from antiquity. And I just think that that was God doing that. Um, but what you need to know is 2,000 years after the New Testament, and uh, 3,500 years after parts of the Old Testament were written, we have what scholars claim is a 99.9% accuracy level of the Bible. And I'm not just making that claim. This is what's really interesting, is before modern archaeology developed, um, what we were doing is we had a copy of 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 the Bible, right? And uh, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, we began to dig up these ancient copies of Scripture. How many of you guys have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? You guys, you heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? So um, all kinds of discoveries were made like that. They dig up the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they find this Scripture that was written thousands and thousands of years ago, and it matches what we have today at a 99.9% level, which is astonishing. I mean, that is astonishing. To give you a little bit of perspective... How many of you guys have ever heard of Plato and Aristotle? Okay, Plato and Aristotle, great. We've heard of Plato and Aristotle. We have 10 antique copies of all of their work combined. Okay, 10 total copies of all of the works of Plato and Aristotle. All of them, this is crucial, you need to understand this, all of them disagree. They all disagree with each other. None of them agree with each other. They all, Plato disagrees with Plato. Aristotle disagrees with Aristotle. We have 10 total copies. Nobody sits down and is like, well, I don't know if Aristotle's really true. None of the copies that we have, none of those 10 copies were written within a thousand years of the life of Plato and Aristotle. Now, the Bible's unique because we have 5,500 copies of ancient scripture um, that we've dug up uh, of the Bible. And I just, for perspective, I brought in 11 reams of paper today, and I just wanted you guys to see how tall this actually is. These are actually kind of astonishingly hard to get out of here, but mm, there we go. Okay, this is, if I, if I were to stack up all the copies of old scripture that we have, it would look like that, okay? And, and imagine 10 sheets of paper of Plato and Aristotle sitting next to 5,500 ancient antique copies of the Old Testament and New Testament, okay? We have, we have copies of the book of John that were written um, 30 years after John wrote them. John wrote them in 90 AD. The oldest copy of the New Testament that we have uh, was, it's called the Murturian Fragment, and it was uh, written in 120 AD, okay? Not 1,000 years later. There is, like, I want you to understand, there's no book in the history of the world from antiquity that has more documented archaeological proof than the Bible. I need you to understand that. Like, that's so crucial. Because people will shed, they'll be like, well, you know, I mean, how do you know it's true? It's a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. This is supernatural. And what I want you to understand is this is rare, okay? Like, people are always like, they're asking me questions. They're like, well, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's probably, you know, they had all that culture. It's just chant. It's, it's not, you know, I mean, it just, it, of course it happened because of scribal culture. I think it's supernatural, okay? Statisticians have, like, tried, and I, whenever somebody quotes odds, I'm skeptical. But nonetheless, academic statisticians have tried to figure out what the chances are, even with all the scribal whatever, so that the Bible could be passed down this many generations as accurately as we know it is. And they say it's one in 750 billion, Okay? 
And I just, I think that's astonishing. You'd have to have 750 billion Earths like live out, or we could just believe that an intelligent creator of the universe supernaturally preserved this book to instruct and inform all of humanity. Okay, and, and whenever I think about it, whenever I start to doubt it and question it, I always just think about this stack right here, and I just think, man, the odds are in my favor. You know, I mean, there, there's more proof about this than there is many other, you know, I mean, there, there's more, way more evidence about Scripture than there is about, you know, um, Josephus, you know, and, and many other antique figures that, that nobody, nobody takes for granted or nobody questions, you know, um, so anyway, that's how the Bible was put together. That's kind of like a little bit of background. I left a ton of stuff out, but, you know, we had to skip over a bunch of stuff. The next thing I want to talk about, and this is probably the question that everybody has in here, is why should I trust the Bible is from God? Okay? How do I actually believe that it's God's word? People ask this one all the time. People want to know, how do I believe the Bible's from God? And I think that's great. And I just want to go through four reasons that I believe the Bible is actually from God. And the first one is because of the archaeological accuracy of Scripture, okay? Because of, um, oh, because of its accuracy, okay? And the first reason under its accuracy is because of the archaeological accuracy of Scripture. Um, there's a famous secular scholar and archaeologist named Nelson Block, Okay, this guy's not a Christian. He's an archaeologist, though, and this is what he says. He goes, it can be categorically stated that no archaeological discovery has ever, has ever controverted a biblical reference. Okay, and we're going to talk about the gravity of this in a moment, but what I want you to understand is there's no coin, mountain range, stream, or character in the Bible where we've discovered something in the ground in antiquity that has controverted something in this book. And that is astonishing. People will all the time be like, oh, it's, uh, you know, and they'll try and come up with all these complaints. I want you to know nothing we've discovered as of yet has controverted scripture, okay? Not every single item in this book is proved by archaeology. Many are, and nothing has ever been controverted. That's a big deal, okay? Um, lots of times people have pointed out, like, a flaw in the Bible and been like, this is proof that the Bible's not real. One of the ones, one of the most famous ones was in the middle 1800s. Um, scholars started pointing out this group of people called the Hittites, okay? And it, it, the Hittites are a group of people in the Bible. They had 40 cities, vast civilization, and uh, everybody always said, well, the Hittites, we have no archaeological evidence for the Hittites, therefore, the Bible is not true. The Bible's a crock, right? And uh, in the late 1800s, several Christian archaeologists said, you know what, let's just use the Bible as a map to find the Hittite cities. And so they began digging, and they found over 40 Hittite cities, which I think is really beautiful, um, all of them exactly where the Bible said they would be, all of them the exact way that the Bible described them as. And I think that's a really cool vindication of Scripture. Another one, there's a character in the Bible named Belshazzar. Everybody say Belshazzar. Belshazzar, cool name. Honey, can we... Maybe? We, if we have a boy? No? Okay. He is an evil king. Um, all right, all right, all right. She looks at me like, no, never. It's a terrible idea. Uh, everybody doubted Belshazzar's existence because Babylonian records, which we had very good Babylonian records of Babylonian monarchy, um, did not include Belshazzar as a king. Then we discovered this thing called the Cylinder of Nabonidus. Now, that's a good name, honey. Nabonidus? Yeah? Yes? That's, a, that's like an ultimate fighter right there. My, my son's name is Nabonidus. Don't mess with him. Uh, he may not look good, but his name's Nabonidus. It's just intimidating, football player type of thing, you know? Um, anyway, they found the cylinder of Nabonidus, which is all about Belshazzar's life. And I love that people were like, Bible's not real. Belshazzar doesn't exist. Bam! Cylinder of Nabonidus. Okay? Uh, in 2 Kings 19, 35 and 36, there's this guy named Sennacherib, who's an Assyrian king. Okay, he's got 185,000 men surrounding Israel. And uh, in that passage of scripture, it says, uh, God supernaturally just destroyed his army one night. And everybody was like, miracles don't really happen if Sennacherib, who nobody contests existed, and who was a great conquering king of Assyria, okay, if, if, if he came to Israel, he would have uh, conquered it. He would have taken the king and gouged out his eyes and cut out his tongue and had him forage for scraps under his table. Because that's what Sennacherib did, right? That's how he ruled as king. There's no way that God, destroy, that, that God destroyed his army. He simply never set foot in Jerusalem. That's what people argued, right? Then, guess what? They discovered something called the Taylor Prism. The Taylor Prism. And in it, it's written by Sennacherib. It's his autobiography. And he says, I conquered all of Israel, just like the Bible says, and trapped Hezekiah like a caged bird in Jerusalem. He did lay siege to Jerusalem 
And then I went home. Because guess what happened? Why would you siege Jerusalem, conquer all of Israel, and then go home? Because God destroyed his army. And of course, he's not going to record that in his autobiography. The Bible says that he went back to the Syrian capital and never left again. And that's actually accurately recorded in the Taylor prison. This was the end of his conquering practices because God's word is real. And God actually destroyed his army supernaturally. And I just, I think it's so cool that we continue to have discoveries like this. And this is what Nelson Block is talking about. Another one, everybody used to argue that Pontius Pilate never existed. Pontius Pilate was never a Roman prefect of, uh, you know, the city of Jerusalem. He never existed. Pontius Pilate presided over Jesus' trial. And, you know, many of you guys know the story. Some of you don't. Well, in... um, the late 60s, a huge marble stone was, was dug up in Jerusalem that said Pontius Pilate, Roman prefect, booyah. You know what I'm talking about, okay? And then uh, in, in uh, this is great, people argued about the star of Bethlehem, you know, and people were like, no, there's no way the star of Bethlehem happened, Chinese, uh, you know, whatever, stargazers would have recorded it in the early 1900s. Guess what? We dug up um, a Chinese record of a comet in the West, Uh, moving across the sky in 3 AD, which would have been the year of Jesus' birth, which I think is really cool. It's probably the wise men who recorded that, right? Um, So really neat. There's all kinds of stuff in the Bible like this. And I wish I could go on. I wish I had more time because I could list them all off. I did list some of my favorite ones. But there's a ton more, hundreds more. Okay, people saying, Bible's not true because of this. And someday you're going to have someone come up to you and be like, well, the Bible's not true because of this. And you'll say, you know what? There's so much that has been proved, and you just wait. Someday we'll dig something up. Booyah, okay? Um, And uh, when you compare this book to other books, I wrote my master's dissertation on the Book of Mormon, which I will tell you, um, I've read a version of it, and it is a fascinating read, okay? Book of Mormon is, uh, it's... It's crazy, a lot of crazy stuff that happens. Um, but in the Book of Mormon, and, and, and last time I preached, I talked about different denominations. And I said, as long as you're in the recipe, you're okay. And I just want to make it clear that Mormons are outside of our recipe, okay? It's a, it's a whole different religion. Even the Mormon president talks about how it's a different religion. It's not Christianity, although Mormons who knock on your door will claim that it is. But nonetheless, um, the Book of Mormon talks about the 10 lost tribes of Israel that traveled to the United States of America, North America, in boats, in rowboats, and then started a civilization there, and then Jesus comes back and hangs out with them for a little bit, okay? So that's like the story of the Book of Mormon. And um, in, that, in that book, they talk all about like mountain ranges and streams and coins and cities and whatever, and uh, they have never found one stream one mountain range? How can you lose a mountain range? One coin talks about animals that didn't exist and haven't existed in the United States, so we domesticated them here. Talks all about them way before they were here, anachronistically. And uh, they've never discovered any of it. There is not a shred, not a shred of archaeological anything that proves that the Book of Mormon is a real book. I want you to understand that the Bible is archaeologically unique, okay? Um, even the, book, the, the Quran... Uh, in uh, in one, of the, one of the parts of the book of Quran, uh, in Surah chapter 5, 157 and 158, talks about how Jesus did not die on the cross. Okay? It was written long after Jesus' crucifixion, and tons of secular sources. Lucian, uh, a non-Christian Roman historian, talks about Christ's death on the cross, contradicting that statement. Arabic history of Israel, written before the Quran, okay? contradicts that statement. It says Jesus died on the cross. Jo- Josephus, Jewish historian, written before the book of Quran, talks about Jesus' death on the cross. In fact, every single secular source that we have, all of them that talk about Jesus, talk about his death on the cross. And some of them even talk about his resurrection, which I think is pretty cool, okay? That's a pretty, that's a pretty cool vindication. I mean, that's, that's a big deal. Uh, you might say that I'm being mean to other religions, but I'll tell you the truth. The Bible says, Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And the reason why I'm so passionate about Jesus is because he claimed to be the only way. And I want people to know that, to find him. You know, And I don't want people following something that isn't real when we know what, no pun intended, is real. Um, <laughs> I didn't intend it, though. Okay. Um, because of the archaeological accuracy of Scripture, the second reason I believe the Bible is from God is because of the scientific accuracy of Scripture. The scientific accuracy of Scripture. The Bible is not at odds with science. I was raised as a kid to believe that I had to close my eyes and plug my ears, la, 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 whenever we talked about science class because, you know, it controversial. And, and you just had to ignore that all that was out there. And I want you to understand 
that as a book, I believe that the Bible lives in harmony with science. I really do. And I think a lot of it, and I've talked about this in great detail in the class that I teach on this, but I believe so much of it depends on, on, on the perspective that you come at it with. Um, I believe that both uh, atheism and Christianity require a huge level of faith okay, in something. I think they both really do. And when you look at the world and when you look at science from the perspective of an intelligent designer and a creator God, um, I think that the Bible really does confirm science and work in harmony with it. Um, Two places in the Bible it talks about dinosaurs. And uh, I want you to understand that scribes copying the Bible always got to these passages in Job and were like, this is kind of weird. We're talking about dinosaurs right now. Now remember, they didn't know dinosaurs existed, okay? It's not like they're digging up dinosaurs, you know, paleontology. And I, sometimes I wonder why so much of my elementary education was devoted to dinosaurs, which it is not useful. Just to be clear, if you're in elementary school and you're learning about dinosaurs, not useful at all. But um, nonetheless... It would be embarrassing to keep this in. You would think the scribes would redact it from Scripture, but ironically, they chose to keep it in because God knew that one day it would be vindicated. I think interestingly enough, in addition to the Bible talking about dinosaurs, um, the Bible talks about the earth being round. This is huge, okay? People were put to death for saying this, but in Isaiah 40, 22, the Bible talks about the earth being round. Thousand years, 1,000 years before humans discovered, discovered, God already knew it, that the earth was round, okay? Now, you need to, you need to get that, that as scribes were copying this for a thousand years, they thought, well, this is just ridiculous. We all know that the earth is flat, you know? But rather than redacting it, they had fanatical devotion to the accuracy of Scripture so that in our day and age, we could look back and be like, yeah, the Bible is true. That's kind of cool. That's kind of interesting, Okay? Um, uh, last one, the Bible talks about stars being innumerable, even though the ancients could only see the stars in the sky. They didn't know that there was a vast set of galaxies beyond that, um, which I think is really cool. So I believe in the Bible because of the archaeological accuracy of Scripture, because of the scientific accuracy of Scripture. This one is the coolest one, just so you know, if your neighbor's falling asleep, this is one worth waking them up for. Um, if your mom's making a grocery list, slap that out of her hand. Just kidding, respectfully. Um, because of the fulfilled prophecy of Scripture... Okay? King David predicts the crucifixion of Jesus a thousand years before Jesus was ever crucified. And now this is big. This is the big part. This is the kicker here. And 700 years before crucifixion was invented as a method of execution. Okay? So imagine somebody in the 1400s being like, I predict that this person will die in an electric chair before electricity exists. You know what I mean? Before an electric chair was invented. That's what happens here. And I want to make it clear that we have documented copies of ancient scripture from before. Before crucifixion was invented, proving that, you know, David did indeed write this, saying what David said, and Jesus is still crucified. So that's pretty cool. Uh, another piece of cool prophecy, Isaiah in Isaiah 53 writes about the death and beating of Christ. He also talks about the crucifixion before it was invented. He talks about the fact that Jesus would be buried in a rich man's tomb, that no bone would be broken, that he would have um, one piece of cloth over him. And, uh, he did all this 500 years before it happened. And I just, I want you to understand the minutia of that prophecy is phenomenal. Many of its facts are confirmed by secular sources, which I think is also really interesting. Okay, um, Ezekiel, and this one's kind of cool, city of Tyre, um, which is a horrible name for a city these days, but the city of Tyre, Ezekiel had a horrible job. He had to go tell people bad news. Do you have friends in your life who only love to tell you bad news? Okay, like that person, like they just can't wait to tell you the most dramatically terrible thing on earth. Like, hey, I just watched Fox News for three hours. Guess what? Do me a favor, you keep that, okay? But anyway, um, he talks about all this bad news stuff and, uh, and, and he goes to the city of Tyre and he's like, and this is like Washington, D.C., okay? It's one of the most stable cities, biggest, most successful cities of that day and age. And the reason why it's so successful is because it's located a mile off the shore so it can't be conquered. And at that time, there was like the cyclical like conquering and pillaging of cities. Tyre couldn't have that happen because it was a mile offshore and people were bad swimmers, kind of like I am, you know? And, and so they couldn't get out there and they couldn't conquer it. It had big walls. And Ezekiel's like, hey, this city's gonna get wiped off the face of the earth. And they all laughed at him. They said, it's ridiculous, we'll never be conquered. And Ezekiel's like, no, God told me, like, this city is actually going to get destroyed. Like, sell your house, get out of here. 200 years later, the unconquerable city was confronted by a man named Alexander the Great. He comes up to them and he's like, hey guys, I'm going to destroy your city. Will you just surrender and save me the time? And they say, no. And so he builds a mile-long siege road into the ocean and he orders his troops to wipe 
the city off the face of the earth. Totally confirmed by scripture, which we have from before the destruction of Tyre occurred, and also confirmed by the destruction of Tyre, and confirmed by Alexander the Great's autobiography. So, pretty neat. Um, the last one, I promise I'm going, I'm, this is, I, I, I gotta go fast. I gotta go fast, honey's giving me the look. But uh, Jesus had a really cool prophecy in Mark 13 too. Um, if you've ever been to Israel, there was this huge temple that was built there by this man named King Herod. It was, uh, you could fit 17 football fields inside of it. It was like the wonder of the world. People would travel from all around the world to come see it, right? It was super huge. Jesus one day walks into the middle of the temple and he's like, hey guys, guess what? Someday, this whole temple is going to get destroyed, and no stone will be left on top of another stone. And people laughed at him. There's like, they, they were like, this, I mean, it would be really hard to destroy this so that no stone was left on top of another stone. That's a pretty minute prophecy, right? I mean, that's kind of ridiculous that you would say it in that specific way. Well, 40 years later, the Jews revolt. They destroy a Roman legion, and Rome sends 20 legions to confirm, con, conform upon Jerusalem. They surround it. They lay siege to it. They have these big things called onagers, which if you have YouTube, they're worth looking up. They're these like old siege engines that catapult these crude firebombs into Jerusalem. They light the temple on fire unintentionally. The general gets in there and he's like, shoot, we were going to steal all the gold from the temple to pay for, you know, all this destruction. Um, and so he tells, he tells his, uh, his troops, he says, do not leave one stone upon another on this mount because the gold inside the temple, the candelabra, all that stuff had melted in between the cracks of the temple. And he's like, we're going to find every single little piece. Isn't that crazy? And so no stone was left up top of another stone on the temple mount, exactly as Jesus had prophesied. This is nuts. Like people were like, wow, shoot, he totally was right. Man, shouldn't have crucified him. Um, Okay, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying, they probably, someone was up there like, oh, yeah, that totally, I totally makes sense. Shoot, man. Um, so, maybe, maybe other words too, who knows. Uh, but because of the archaeological accuracy of Scripture, scientific accuracy of Scripture, fulfilled prophecy, and uh, my last point is because of the psychological insight of Scripture. I believe that the Bible is from God for all the reasons that I've listed. If you're not convinced yet, I believe in the Bible because of it's psychological insight. I just think the Bible gets us. I think that the Bible understands us. Romans 3.23 says um, that everybody's sinful. And that sounds really bad, but uh, it was kind of, um, you know, made clear to me after I had children that people really are born sinful, right? I mean, I don't have to teach my children to be bad. Like, I don't have to be like, Isabel, this is how you misbehave. She does that on her own, like pretty naturally and effectively, especially Hermione with hitting dad in the face. She kicked me in the eye the other day with her heel, like just boom, open eye. I was like, honey, I might be blind now, but I was fine. She's like, you're a hypochondriac, calm down. Um, okay, but hey, look. I think that the Bible understands human nature at a level that even modern psychology doesn't get. The Bible understands that, hey, we're fallen. We're depraved, you know? Like, people, you watch the news for a while, you see what we do, you see the choices we make, like, we need a redeemer. I think the Bible understands that, like, really understands that, and especially in our society today with a level and capacity that other sources don't get. Uh, Proverbs 13, 20 says, he who walks with the wise grows wise, but he who walks with fools suffers harm. I love this verse. It just, I feel like there's so many different pieces of wisdom and scripture that communicate to my heart, that understand our world. And I think this book speaks to us because it was written by the person who made us, by the person, by the being that made us. And I don't think it's surprising when we think about it that way, how scripture is supernaturally just that way. Um, now, I know a lot of you guys are like, I'm logical, and this is great. I don't know if you guys have friends in your life that claim to be logical people, like, give me proof, give me whatever, I'm a logical person. I love to claim that I'm a critical thinker, that I'm a logical person, but here's the honest truth. We all claim to be logical, but even us people who claim to be logical, we're all just emotional, irrational beings. I think it's so true, because I claim that this stuff is going to be like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a logical guy, I need logic, but at the end of the day, you know what really moves me? It's my feelings, anecdote. You know, and uh, I think all the stuff is really cool. It does mean a lot to me. Um, but at the end of the day, the real reasons that I follow the Bible, that I believe it's the word of God, uh, these last two are probably the biggest to me. And it's not because of all this proof that we've talked about, which I think is really good. But number one, I believe the Bible because Jesus believed it was the word of God. Okay? I want to make this clear. Jesus affirms the Bible. And I don't know of anybody else who raised himself 
from the dead, okay? Now, you could tell me that, hey, this is really cool. You know, I got this going on in my life. I believe in this. I believe in that. I'm like, you know, I only know of one being that raised himself from the dead, and that's Jesus. Jesus said a lot of cool stuff about the Bible. He believed in a literal Adam and Eve. He believed that Jonah was literally in the belly of a fish for three days. And consequently, we have many modern accounts of fishermen who have been swallowed by whales and then spat up again days later. They, uh, this is kind of cool when you read the story of Jonah because when this happens to people, all their hair gets melted off and their skin gets bleached. So that's just kind of, and, and their clothes melts too, off. So when you just, when you, when you think about Jonah getting thrown up on shore and you just, you put that image in there, um, it kind of makes the story more exciting. Just, you know, little tidbits, add a little spice to the story. Um, Moses, Jesus affirms that Moses wrote the first five books of scripture. Jesus affirms that Abraham was a real person. Uh, Jesus affirms that David was a real person. And Jesus affirms that Noah and the flood were literal history. He affirms that it literally really happened. And when I look at the Bible, if Jesus says these things are true, I'm going to believe it. And there's no doubt that Jesus existed. There's no doubt that of any human figure, there's nobody who's changed the world more than Jesus. You can argue with me about that, but you're wrong. You are, um, empirically. Um, I believe this book because Jesus believed it, and at the end of the day, I believe this book is from God because of the way, and this is anecdote, this is that illogical thing, but because of the way it's transformed my life. And I just, I think about it, you might not be a Jesus follower in here. You might have been a Jesus follower in here. You might not think the Bible is true, but I want you to understand that there's no document, even the Constitution of the United States, your Bill of Rights, none of it has transformed your life more than this book. Like, that's true. I mean, all of your freedom was rooted in this book. The Bill of Rights was written because of this book. People came here because of this book. The world has been totally transformed because of this book. And at the end of the day, I want you to know, I want you to know, I'm a critical thinker. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a super skeptical about all things. It's really difficult to get me to, to believe things. And yet, I just have to say that my life has been transformed by the Word of God, like completely. Jesus has changed me from a pessimist into an optimist. Jesus has turned me into someone who believed the worst, into somebody who has believed the best. I want you to know that because of God's word in my life, I am a new creation. Jesus has used this to transform me. And I just think, as a church, what could transform our community more? What could transform this group of people more than if we lean into the word of God? I could leave with like a big, you know, altar call or whatever, but I, this is what I want to do for First Church today. I want to challenge us to read the Bible this week, okay? Not all of it. Don't start in the book of Genesis and say, I'm just going to read it all through. Pastor, you know, that's, that's exactly what I told you not to do. Were you listening to a word that I was saying, okay? Don't do that. What if we just, what if we just read the Bible this week? There's so many different ways you can do it. You can go to BibleGateway.com and just do a keyword search on forgiveness, you know, or whatever, on marriage, you can do it. You can do it that way. Um, the way that I do it is, I uh, I have an app on my phone called the U version, which is the most popular Bible application in the world. It has almost infinite translations of scripture. I mean, a ton. Almost every translation of scripture is in there. Multiple different languages. Um, if if English isn't your first language, and you can do all kinds of studies in there. If you want to do a study on bitterness, if you want to do a study on forgiveness, if you want to do a study on grief, and they're really simple, like two minutes. Okay? And that's just, that's how I get my Bible every day. I do it right there. My girls, um, we read the Bible after nap time using the YouVersion Kids app, which is kind of a fun, like, interactive thing that I can do with them. My kids are one and three, and they love it. Okay? Like, you can get your family into the Word of God. You guys can do a study together, and it takes no time. And what if you just sat at dinner for, for seven days this week? You know what? Let's just talk about the Bible. My wife and I use a process called SOAP. SOAP. You can write this down in your notes. First, you read the scripture, soap, okay? Then you observe what's in the scripture. You just think, okay, this is what it's saying to me, these, these things, okay? Then application, S-O-A, application. How can I apply it to my life, okay? And this is crucial. Don't just read the Bible and observe stuff in it. Think, how can this book change my life today? I think this is the mistake. So many people just do so. We've got a lot of so Christians. I want so uh, Christians. And the last one is pray. God, will you help me apply the Bible to me in this way? 
I just don't think there's a better thing that we can be challenged to do as a church than get into the Word of God. I think it'll transform our lives. I want to challenge you to consider doing an actual reading plan. If you don't have a Bible, I just want to emphasize to you, or if you have like a King James only Bible that you do not understand, please take one of the Bibles out of our pew backs. They're free 99. You can have them for free. We want to give that to you. That's a gift. Take them out. Don't, don't ask for permission. Don't ask anybody. Just grab it and take it out of here. This is the Word of God. You know, we can do that. We want to do that. It is God, God's blessed this church, and we want to bless you. Um, I think, I think that's what I got. I just, I hope this was instructional for you guys. I hope that you learned a lot, but more than anything, I hope that church is a transforming thing for us because we don't come here to go through a bunch of staunchy ritual. Jesus has transformed the world. And if we come to church and we don't change anything at all, if our lives are not impacted, we're failing. Okay. Okay. I want us to be transformed. Let's get into the word of God this week. Let's do great things. God's hand is on our lives. Let's close with a word of prayer. Jesus, I thank you for supernaturally giving us your word. I thank you that you loved us so much that you saw fit to supernaturally preserve a great instruction manual for life. I thank you that you care about little things, little details. I thank you that you speak into so many different things of our life. Lord, I thank you that you care about grief. I thank you that you care about problems that we're going through. I thank you that you provide wisdom on how to get through that. And I just ask that we as a church, Lord, could walk in your wisdom and in your word this week, Lord. I ask that you would transform Indiana. I ask that you would transform our community through your gospel. And I just ask that that would begin with us as a body being rooted in the Bible. Bible, Lord. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for what you've done for us. And it's in his unchanging, matchless name that we ask and pray these things. Amen.